Next on the News at 9, a community gathers for a tribute to murdered NYPD officer Randolph Holder. Tonight, the mayor responds to a strongly worded op-ed piece by the president of the PBA. And a developing story in Oklahoma, a suspected drunk driver slams into a crowd at a homecoming parade, and we just learned a fourth person has died. And putting a cap on it, President Obama says students should limit the amount of time they spend on standardized tests in schools. You're watching WLNY TV 1055 News at 9. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the News at 9. I'm Jessica Schneider in tonight for Cindy Shu. A memorial today in honor of NYPD officer Randolph Holder shot to death Tuesday in East Harlem. As TV 1055 Steve Langford reports, the morning isn't completely without some posturing. We come together so no mother like young officer Holder's mom has to be without their son. Tributes and tears for another New York City police officer killed from a community all too familiar with loss and heartbreak. We who unapologetically fight bad policing, we unapologetically support good police. And his loss is a loss to all of us. A vigil for murdered officer Randolph Holder in front of the East Harlem police station he worked out of. A mother who can relate to such pain, making a statement with her presence. He has a family just like I had a family. He has a family. They're hurting and they need support. I'm a progressive person. I am a humanitarian, but I can also tell you some people are irredeemable. Mayor de Blasio taking a strong stand Friday about keeping career criminals like Tyrone Howard accused of shooting Officer Holder to death, locked up. But that stance questioned in an opinion piece by PBA President Patrick Lynch Saturday. Lynch writing in part, quote, police officers want City Hall to be our partner in keeping New York safe. But that partnership can't succeed if the only time officers feel their efforts are supported and their contributions valued is when one of us has made the ultimate sacrifice. How about a question about oh, Patrick oh, Lynch's uh, op-ed piece? Sorry guys, you can email the press office, we'll get to you later we did. today. The mayor not talking, but his office releasing a statement later stating in part, quote, Mayor de Blasio has hired 1,300 new officers to support NYPD and enhance safety for all our neighborhoods, making NYC the safest large city in the country. Crime statistics from the NYPD show the city's murder rate is up 8.3% compared to a year ago, amid a certain unity across the spectrum in mourning the death of a young man just trying to protect this city. In East Harlem, Steve Langford, TV 1055. Funeral services for Officer Holder are set for next week. The wake will be held Tuesday, beginning at 9 a.m. at the Greater Allen AME Cathedral of New York in Jamaica, Queens. Holder's funeral will be held Wednesday at 3 p.m. at the same location. His body will then be flown to his native Guyana for burial. Well, should your kids spend less time on standardized testing? President Obama says yes, so now schools are being urged to scale back. TV 1055's Dave Carlin is here with more on school testing limits being pushed by the president. Dave. Jessica, the White House just released 10 pages of recommendations to end what it calls burdensome testing. Some parents and teachers applaud the plan, but others worry this could cause other problems. Learning is about so much more than just filling in the right bubble. In a video posted on Facebook, President Obama says he wants standardized testing capped at 2% of classroom time. He is urging schools to pull back, not use the tests to evaluate teachers, and root out redundant testing. So we're going to work with states, school districts, teachers and parents, to make sure that we're not obsessing about testing. I do agree, actually, with what he's saying. There are kids that really don't test very well. It stresses them out. It shouldn't have to like determine what like college you go to. I'm judged on like this test and I just don't think it's fair. 70 school districts were surveyed and the results released Saturday show standardized testing has exploded in the past decade. A typical American student takes 112 mandated standardized tests between pre-K and 12th grade. Most countries that outperform the U.S. on international exams like China and Korea test students only three times during their school careers. Stop, come, come. 
The debate stems from President George W. Bush's No Child Left Behind law and intensified last spring with new Common Core tests, leaving politicians haggling over the government's role in education. It also led to opt-out movements across the country. Some educators warn against going too far with reforms, saying the tests can help schools expose weaknesses and redirect resources, and they worry a cap on the amount of testing time might tangle schools and regulations. Michael Casserly is executive director of the Council of the Great City Schools. It's very possible that depending on uh, what is under the cap and what is over the cap, uh, you could actually have uh, less time on testing, but it'd be about as dysfunctional as it is now. The president and education secretary will outline this plan on Monday when they meet with a group of teachers and other school officials. Jessica. All right, thanks, Dave. Now on to the Mets championship chase. Next stop, the World Series. Game one will be in Kansas City on Tuesday, but today the Mets were at City Field getting back into the swing of things. Steve Overmeyer is here now with more. Steve. Yeah, a lot of time off to try to get things back right once again. It has been a dream season for the Mets. A trip to the World Series a year really before they were expected to be contenders, and now they know their opponent will be a scrappy Kansas City team. The Mets are flying out tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., so today was their final workout at City field before heading off to KC. We found out the Mets ace Matt Harvey will start game one of the World Series in 12 innings this postseason. He has 16 strikeouts and most importantly two wins. He's the kind of guy who wants the ball because he's the kind of guy that rises to the occasion. I called him all in today, gave him the whole all the reasons and told him what the rotations were and I said to him around I said you ready for it? And he looked at me and he said damn right. So and I told him, listen, there might be, you know, obviously you're going to get two starts, but game seven may be something. He said, I'll be ready. So that's that's the only guy I know. Well, one rookie is no stranger to the World Series because he's already played in one 11 years ago. Michael Conforto represented Team USA in the Little League World Series. He was also in the College World Series at Oklahoma or at Oregon State, rather, and now the true fall classic. And one more sports note. Sports update friend and punter Steve Weatherford is back in the NFL. Today he was signed by the Jets. Jessica, that means he will be suiting up for Gang Green tomorrow against the Patriots. Very exciting. We'll look forward to that yep. as well as the Mets next week. Very it's exciting be a fun stuff. Week. Exactly. Thanks so much, Steve. Well, investigators believe the fire that destroyed an historic New Jersey synagogue was accidental. Flames moved quickly and left little behind at the Pole Zedek Synagogue. A caretaker was the only one inside the nearly 100-year-old building yesterday when that fire started. He managed to get out safely, but several, several Torah scrolls were destroyed in the blaze. A firefighter was able to rush in and rescue just one of them. It is still unclear what caused the fire, but right now investigators do not believe it is suspicious. One person is killed after a crash on the Southern State Parkway. The accident happened last night near exit 28 South in Wanta. Police say a driver going eastbound lost control of the car. The vehicle hit the divider, went airborne, and slammed into another car traveling westbound. The driver of the first car was killed. Passengers in the other car had some minor injuries. We're following a developing story in Oklahoma. We have just learned four people are now dead after a driver plowed into a crowd during Oklahoma State University's homecoming parade. The latest victim, a two-year-old. TV 1055's Brian Webb has more. Victims were treated in the middle of Main Street after a car plowed into a parked police motorcycle, then crashed into a crowd of spectators at a high rate of speed a few blocks from campus. We can kind of hear a little screaming and uh, sound like a vehicle accelerating. And uh, luckily this car uh, hit a big pole. I think it would, have, it would have hurt a lot more people. At least four people were killed. Dozens more were injured. Some victims were airlifted to hospitals in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. The the Oklahoma State uh, Homecoming Parade is probably one of the most wholesome, happy events in, in the country. And to have it fouled like this and these victims, these, this terrible tragedy. 25-year-old Stillwater resident Adacia Chambers is in jail, charged with driving under the influence. Authorities don't know if the incident was an accident or intentional. We treat these like we would any homicide investigation. It will probably take several days to get additional information. The homecoming game was played as scheduled just a few hours after the incident 
with stadium flags flying at half staff and a moment of silence in honor of the victims. Brian Webb, TV 1055. And this isn't the first tragedy to strike Oklahoma State. In 2001, 10 men's basketball players were killed in a plane crash coming home from a game. And in 2011, the women's basketball team uh, and assistant, co the basketball coach and assistant were among four killed in a plane crash during a recruiting trip. Deadly violence today at a checkpoint between Israel and the West Bank. Israeli forces shot and killed a knife-wielding Palestinian man. The man reportedly ran toward a crossing between Israel and the West Bank and tried to stab security personnel. This is the first time a West Bank crossing has been targeted since violence started to escalate there in mid-September. And Secretary of State John Kerry says Israel and Jordan are working to reduce Israeli-Palestinian violence. Kerry met with Jordan's foreign minister as he continued his trip to the Middle East. He says Israel and Jordan have agreed to video monitoring a holy site in Jerusalem that is sacred to Jews and Palestinians. Tensions at the site have reportedly fueled recent violence between those two groups. The bodies of 40 migrants washed ashore in Libya today. Libya's Red Crescent says search efforts are underway now for another 30 migrants believed to have been on the boat that capsized. And thousands of refugees continue to pour into the nation of Slovenia as they make their way across Europe. Officials say 58,000 asylum, asylum seekers have entered the country in the past week. Many walked along a seven-mile stretch to a refugee camp today to board buses taking them to Austria. An emergency European Union meeting is set for tomorrow to deal with that refugee crisis. Catholic bishops take steps towards supporting the Pope's call for a more welcoming church. Bishops from around the world wrapped up a three-week Sinai on the family today at the Vatican. In the final document, bishops agreed to be more compassionate toward divorcees who have remarried outside the church, but they rejected calls for more welcoming language toward homosexuals. Landmarks around the world are bathed in blue tonight in honor of the United Nations. Here in New York, the Empire State Building has a blue glow to celebrate the UN's 70th anniversary. More than 60 countries are participating in the global celebration. The first events kicked off in New Zealand and at the Sydney Opera House in Australia, the pyramids in Egypt, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and more than 200 other landmarks will also be lit in the official color of the UN. A rough ride for thousands of Long Island Railroad commuters this weekend. The big changes they have to deal with because of a construction project. And looking for a hotel room? We'll show you one that is so small it fits into a shipping container. And torrential rain from Patricia at Pummels, parts of Texas, causing a freight train to derail. Elise. Well, Jessica, we don't have anything that dramatic coming our way, but we do have several chances for rain, the first of which is tomorrow. I'll have those details coming up in your first forecast. Yeah, it's but if you do actually want to sleep, it's well sleeping you can do. It's just moving around to before you go to sleep will be a little a little a little difficult. Yeah, it was it, it's it's surprisingly small. Can you turn to your left? Simon says. Yeah, what are you doing? You know, probably we'll get from nowhere in this business. No, no, she was my dad's house. Still looking. And so I still have to be facing like that? And we'll try the camera. I'm looking.
New at 9, flash floods in Texas cause a freight train to derail and overturn after running into that high water. The heavy rains hitting Texas are remnants of what was once Hurricane Patricia. But as TV 1055's Kenneth Craig tells us, the storm is still packing quite a punch. The roof of this car is barely visible. Too much rain and nowhere to go in Corsicana, Texas. More than a foot of rain came down Friday. Streets were submerged, leaving many drivers stranded in their vehicles. I just didn't think I could make it. And so I stopped and like freaked out and called 911. And they were like, we'll just stay there. The relentless rain washed away tracks, causing a freight train to derail about 60 miles south of Dallas. Flash flooding also shut down a major highway between Dallas and Houston for hours. Traffic was backed up for miles. South and central Texas are preparing for another round of misery. Remnants of Hurricane Patricia, which hit Mexico as a Category 5 storm, are expected to dump more rain on the saturated ground Saturday night into Sunday morning. Saturday afternoon, officials also issued a voluntary evacuation order for residents in part of Galveston County and are offering them transportation and shelter. We'll take it one, one hour by a time and see how it goes. As, as the tide comes in and the waves get bigger, we'll make a decision if we need to get out of here. And flash flood watches will remain in effect for parts of Texas through Monday. And last night, Hurricane Patricia roared on shore in southwest Mexico as a Category 5 hurricane. Patricia battered Mexico's coastline with 165 mile per hour winds. Despite the storm's power, she did surprisingly little damage. Tourists who were evacuated from waterfront hotels in and around Puerto Vallarta were back on the beach today, impressed by how well Mexico handled that potentially dangerous storm. People at our hotel knew what they were doing. Everybody was very friendly, took very good care of us, definitely felt safe. They took precautions. They evacuated us from our hotel early. They took us to a safe place to stay. Experts say the fact that Hurricane Patricia was moving so fast and hit a sparsely populated area, that helped keep damage to a minimum. And whether we'll see any rain or not this week, we'll hand it over to Elise Finch, uh, our exclusive first forecast at the News at 9. Elise, what's it looking like? Well, it is looking like some rain for us. Of course, nothing as dramatic as what we just saw, but I want to talk about Patricia, or at least what's left of Patricia for just a second. This is where that remnant low is right now. Now, of course, it picked up tremendous amount of strength over that incredibly warm ocean water. And then once it got over land, hurricanes always fall apart. But of course, this mountainous region really just ripped that storm apart. So it basically lost its steam and power just as quickly as it gained it. Right now we're talking about a system that has 30 mile an hour winds. It's moving northeast at 22 miles per hour. So yes, this becomes an issue for the folks in Texas and Louisiana. For us, not so much, but we still have a chance to see some rain. Highs today, well, not very high. We're talking about temps in the 50s. 57 the hot spot for Newark at 57 degrees. Central Park at 55. Same for Islip and LaGuardia. 55 degrees, that's our current temperature. And I got to tell you, it's well below where we should be. The average 61. We didn't get there today at all, but we'll be getting closer. Right now we're at 55. We're sitting at 50 for White Plains and Babylon 52 for Sparta with 44 in the Hamptons and 46 in Monticello. So we do have some chilly locations. What you should expect is some cloudy uh, skies through tonight. We'll also add some light showers to the mix as we start off your day tomorrow, starting with some of those light showers, but we do get some clearing by your Sunday afternoon, and then we're expecting a cool and bright start to next week. So we do have some good things to look forward to. I'll tell you more about the rain heading our way, plus the brightening skies coming up in just a bit. Jessica. All right, finally feeling like fall. Thanks, Elise. Well, film legend Maureen O'Hara has died, known as Holly Hollywood's queen of technicolor because of her cascading red hair and stunning green eyes. O'Hara's career spanned more than 60 films. They included How Green Was My Valley and The Quiet Man and of course the Christmas classic Miracle on 34th Street. O'Hara died in her sleep today at her home in Boise, Idaho. She was 95 years old. Now in medical news, being a chocoholic may actually be a real thing. A recent study found some symptoms of food addiction are much like drug addiction. Researchers at the University of Michigan created a list of the most addictive types of food. Processed food like chocolate, pizza, ice cream, and soda topped that list. And food high in fat and salt like cheese and bacon followed. Fruits and vegetables, unfortunately, were the least addictive. Researchers said much like drug addiction, highly processed foods can create anxiety or agitation of withdrawal when people just can't have it. 
Well, get ready for a dose of adorable. Check out this video. This brave knight, if we can see it right now, and her trusty steed. All of these dogs were pack, uh, part of a pack of pooches and pet owners who strutted their stuff at the 25th annual Tompkins Square Dog Parade. New York's premier pet parade is all about costumes and creativity, and the day, it would not have been complete without a pizza rat sighting. There it is. And, of course, Dognold Trump. There he is, I think, barking up votes. There we go. Well, coming up tonight, we are living large in the Garden State. With views that extend 30 miles, there's also an art gallery in the home and another surprise that's coming up in Living Large. Tonight's Living Large takes us to Bernardsville, New Jersey. The home was even featured in Architectural, Architectural Digest. Here's TV 1055's Emily Smith. On Peachcroft Drive, you enter what's called the Teager House. Inside, we met the architect. Hi, I'm Emily. Hi, I'm Michael Brandis. The architects set out to create a contemporary space that's warm, fun, and country. It's an array of all natural materials to make the house feel much warmer than most contemporary homes. The views face west with lots of windows. So the house is built on a hill? Yeah, well, we're on the whole mountaintop here, but this is the best view in, in town. The floors are Yukon Silver Limestone from New Mexico with matching kitchen counters. The Yukon Silver Limestone continues to the outside to help blur the lines between inside and out. So you can see that the limestone stairs transitioned into the, this beautiful hand waxed steel. You can see the gallery that was created. So this person is a serious art collector. Absolutely. There's also outdoor space next to it with a 25 meter lap pool, regulation size for lap swimming. With underwater speakers and windows. Oh, you can listen to music underwater? Yes. There's also windows so that you can observe the stroke from below. This is the bridge over to the master bedroom, okay. which captures the main living space again. In here, you have an open hallway that leads right into a master bathroom. There's no doors even. So you're just kind of walking 
from the master right into the bathroom. Yep. And the floor drops down into a spa tub. So you just get it, and you have the water filled up already. Yep. Which, by the way, you can you can call from your car and fill the fill the tub. Oh, of course. Plus a full steam shower and a maze of closets. Outside, you find one of two guest cottages. This one, a miniature version of the home. Again, this is sort of the rhythm of the volumes that were to continue into that house, so it's all based on a grid system. Here's another piece of art, a tree sculpture made of cast aluminum by artist Hugo Rondendone, one of three in the world, Turpin's Ashley Christus. It was actually brought to the property and lifted over the house by a crane and placed here. To live large on this 11 and a half acre property, it will cost you $5,195,000. And that was living large, but small is the new big thing in hotel rooms. Moxie Hotels will soon be coming to the Big Apple. The rooms are just 185 square feet and could fit inside a shipping container. Designers say they've done away with closets and dressers because travelers rarely use them. Instead, rooms are open and made to feel like apartments and include what customers want. Everybody travels these days with more than three devices. Well, what does that mean for us from a hotel standpoint? It means that they're looking for Wi-Fi. Of course, they're looking for outlets. The new Moxie hotels could be ready for check-in early next year. Well, coming up, delays and disruptions. An inconvenient weekend for tens of thousands of Long Island Railroad commuters. What you need to know to get around. Plus, a teen is disqualified during a cross-country competition, but the reason could surprise you. And what one airport worker did to cause an American Airlines plane to get taken out of service. You're watching WLNY TV 1055 News at 9. Welcome back. Here's a look at our top stories. A two year old is one of four people killed today during the homecoming parade at Oklahoma State University. A woman hit a parked motorcycle, then crashed her car into the crowd. Police believe that woman was drunk. 
An emotional prayer vigil today outside the East Harlem Police Precinct and the NYPD officer gunned down this week. The Reverend Al Sharpton said the city stands with the family of Officer Randolph Holder. A wake will be held Tuesday and Officer Holder's funeral is set for Wednesday. President Obama says pencils down. He's calling for a cap on standardized testing. The White House is now urging schools to pull back and just release 10 pages of recommendations to end what it calls burdensome testing. And right now at 930, tens of thousands of commuters are facing major delays on the LIR this weekend. And some of them, as you can imagine, are not happy about it. TV 1055's Alana Gold talked to commuters about their rough ride. LIRR passengers at the Hicksville station have no choice but to pack onto buses this weekend to get between here and Mineola because the trains are at a standstill. It's inconvenient to have to go through so many channels to get to one destination. Shirley Bradford's on her way to a baby shower in New Jersey. Now she has to sit and wait for this bus to fill up before heading out. I have to be someplace at 1 o'clock. Do you think you're going to make it? I don't think it's going to be 1 o'clock. The MTA says tens of thousands of people can expect delays up to an hour, something Max Transu from Levittown wasn't willing to deal with trying to get to Manhattan. We were going to go to Central Park one last time before it gets super cold, but uh, I think we're going to skip that today. This $17.5 million construction project in Westbury has led to the halt in train service. Crews are rebuilding the new Ellison Avenue bridge near Roosevelt Field Mall that carries cars over the LIRR tracks. The MTA tore down the 75-year-old crumbling structure in May, and this weekend workers are laying down concrete. I'm glad they're doing it. The improvements, something commuters greatly welcome. How badly is that needed? Oh, I think it is needed. That's why some don't mind a few days of LIRR delays. I thought we were going to have bedlam, but this has been great. In exchange for better infrastructure. The trains will start running again between Hicksville and Mineola on Monday before the morning rush. In Hicksville, Long Island, Ilana Gold, TV 1055. The MTA says cars will be able to drive on the Ellison Avenue bridge in April. The project should be complete in the summer. Now to an alert for drivers in New Jersey. The Pulaski Skyway is now closed in both directions until 5 a.m. Monday. The closures include most on and off ramps, including the southbound ramp from Tonelli Circle. Crews are installing new floor beams and deck panels. A Dutchess County couple is under arrest, charging the gruesome death of the man's mother. Police say 48-year-old Charles Cole strangled his 76-year-old mother at the Pleasant Valley Motel, where they both lived, along with the man's wife, Yolanda, or sorry, Ronalda. Investigators say the couple kept the woman's body at the motel for seven weeks, transported it to South Carolina, and allegedly dumped it in the woods. The body was found a week ago, not far from Interstate 95, in a town northwest of Charleston, South Carolina. An airport maintenance worker really wanted some selfies, but where he took the photos has landed him in some pretty hot water. The Swiss port contractor was caught taking the selfies on the wings of two planes at Boston's Logan Airport on Thursday. He was escorted off the tarmac and his security badge was taken away. The American Airlines and JetBlue planes were inspected for damage. And of course, passengers weren't too happy when they heard what had happened. I put a lot of trust in, in, the, in the people I, I fly with, so, you know, I don't want to hear about stuff like that happening. I think that the whole selfie thing has gotten a little out of control. He probably is going to be fired. Should be. Massachusetts State Police say the worker wasn't arrested and his employer will decide if he'll be disciplined. Well, an amazing act of sportsmanship leads to a disqualification. High school cross-country runner Zach Hoagland spotted a rival runner collapse near the finish line during the state qualifying meet, so he jumped in to help. But the rules state that no runner can help or receive aid from another runner, so Hoagland was disqualified. Despite the outcome, Hoagland said he knows he did the right thing, and while the DQ stands, he will be allowed to compete in next week's meet. Well, never mind this seaweed. Coming up, giant prehistoric shark teeth are showing up on North Carolina beaches. And we don't exactly have beach weather. It's a little on the cool side. We've got the clouds moving in and also some rain. But I'll tell you about the rain and also when things warm up a bit. Coming up in your full forecast. This Pocono Mountain Peak is brought to you by the Pocono Mountains Visitors Bureau. Life's greater in the Pocono Mountains.
weirdest things in the, in the world. That is weird. You're not on. That's just... Okay. Which one? E what? So here's the deal. Yeah. This is your last block. She'll come back from weather. Okay. Uh, I'll let you know whether it's just you two on the take back or mm -hmm. if it's a take back on a three shot. Then you turn, toss to Steve. Steve does his little thing. Okay. Then take back on camera four, but you talk to three for your final story. And I'll count you to off air. 43 straight up is the off. Okay. You end early, don't worry. They go to an outside shot. Okay. Confusing, huh? Yeah, I think I got that, but you might. Weather? <laughs> sports? Yep. Sports? A walk on the beach turns into a lesson in prehistory for a North Carolina beachgoer. Experts say a giant shark's tooth belonged to a malog. Let's see if I can pronounce this. Megalodon, a giant shark-like creature that swam the seas more than five million years ago. For scientists, it's a record of history, but for the man who found the tooth, it was an awe-inspiring experience. It was just like, oh my God, I'm the first one to touch that since it fell out of his mouth or whatever, you know, back in the day. It's nice to um, to have people finding and discovering fossils because it helps with our with our past and the record of our paleontology of North Carolina. Experts experts say rainy weather and beach renourishment projects are unearthing those fossils from the ocean floor. The North Carolina coast is known as a premier spot for finding those giant fossilized shark's teeth. That's pretty amazing. And if only I knew how to pronounce meg Megalodon. 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 That's a tough one. All right. <laughs> Elise, can you pronounce it any better? Well, and if I, not, just give us a forecast. Well, I guess yeah, that works. Now, because you already said it, you did the hard <laughs> a work. A few times. Megalodon. That's a diff <laughs> difficult one. <laughs> now I can because you fixed it for me. So things are looking interesting around here, right? Temperatures are starting to get warmer tonight. And we do have some rain on the way. So let's go ahead and check in with some of our weather watchers, see what kinds of temperatures we are seeing across the tri state area. We'll get started in the lower Hudson Valley, where we do have a lot of upper 40 degree temperatures, right? So definitely chilly. This is Walter and Tompkins Cove. He says it's 49 degrees where he is. If we head out to Long Island, we're getting a lot of readings here in the low 50, so a little bit warmer. This is Brian in Long Beach. He says it's 51 where he is. Some of our warmest locations are into New Jersey. This is David. David is in Bayonne. He says it's 56 degrees and his note is getting warmer as the night goes on. So nice outside right now. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty nice temperature wise, but we do have increasing cloud cover and eventually we'll have some rain. So let's go outside. Take a live look, see what's going on. I mean, this is our look outside. Looks lovely, but it is cloudy. It's a little on the cool side, 55 degrees. Now, it's still the warmest temp of the day, but it's a little on the cool side. Winds are out of the south southeast at seven miles per hour. So here are your headlines. We are expecting a little bit of rain tonight. And as we head into the early part of tomorrow, we will get some sunshine for your Sunday. Of course, that doesn't come until the afternoon is when we get the clearing. And then temperatures, while they rebound a bit tomorrow, they drop for your Monday. So a chilly start to the work week. Here's the temperature trend. We were a warm 77. 
67 on Thursday, 65 degrees yesterday, 55 today. We jump up by 10 degrees for tomorrow, right? So Sunday temperature wise, beautiful, but then Monday we're back into those mid and upper 50. So it's a chilly start to the work week. We are expecting some rain. We of course need the rain. The deficit just over eight inches on the year. So we've had just under 33 inches of rain. We need more. Eh, we're not going to get eight inches, of course, but we will get a little bit. Here's your vortex satellite and radar showing the clouds. Here is the system that's moving in, right? So we'll get a little bit of rain out of the system starting tonight and moving into the day tomorrow. Here is the setup for us as we go forward. Turning on the future cast, it shows when that rain is coming. For the most part, we're talking four or five o'clock on your Sunday morning. And basically that rain starts to get out of here late Sunday morning. So by Sunday afternoon, we are seeing some sunshine and some nice clearing. Tonight, cloudy skies, late showers, 52 degrees. As we head into the day tomorrow, we're talking about 65 degree temperatures. Again, we get that clearing in the afternoon. So tomorrow's not a bad end to the weekend. Work week starts out sunny, but cool. And then we gradually warm up a bit. All Jessica right. looking pretty nice. Thanks so much, Elise and Steve Overmeyer is here with a look what's coming up in sports. Steve. And you know what? It really is all about the Mets right now, isn't it? And why not? We're going to have more on the World Series bound Mets and why the Royals approach at the plate makes them an especially difficult opponent. And if you're a fan of the game, you have at least considered buying game used merchandise. Well, we're going to go behind the scenes of this market with the man in charge of MLB's authentication program. That is next on Sports Update. All right. All Mets all the time. Thanks right. so much, Steve. And there is more news ahead. Here's a look at what's coming up on our sister station, CBS 2 News at 11. It upset me because I treat my dog like it was my own kid. A man's dog injured by a speeding driver. Now he's using words to make people slow down. Plus a health alert at Whole Foods. Why a popular product is being pulled from the shelves. Those stories and more coming up at 11. Meanwhile, police in Florida had their hands full trying to free a seven foot alligator after it got stuck in a storm drain. A resident was trying to prevent the gator from getting hit by a car as it was trying to climb out of that storm drain last night, but instead pushed the gator further down the drain. Police used a dog leash to close its mouth, secured it with duct tape and pulled the gator out of the drain. Hmm. It was then taken to an alligator farm. That's quite the rescue there. Well, that's going to do it for us here on the News at 9. We'll have have your updates later tonight on our sister station, CBS 2 News at 11. Stay tuned for the WLNY Sports Update. That is next. Welcome to Sports Update with Steve Overmeyer.
And we welcome you to the show as we prepare for the Mets in the World Series. And by the time they take the field in Kansas City on Tuesday, it's going to be five days off, which actually might not be a good thing because teams with five days off have lost five of the last six World Series. Today, the team finishing up their final workouts in City Field. We did find out how they're going to set up the rotation. Matt Harvey will get the ball in game one, partly to give Jacob DeGrom a little extra rest, mainly because Harvey steps up on the biggest stage. DeGrom will go in game two, followed by Noah Syndergaard, then Steven Matz. The Mets starters have the best ERA and strike out more batters than any team in the postseason, but the Royals are experts at putting the ball in play. Their contact percentage was number one in baseball this year. Our guys strike people out. So if we're not striking people out, we better catch the baseball. So now we got to really, as again, as I just said, you really, we've really got to make sure, you know, defensively, we got the right people there. But I still think we'll strike some people out because I think our guys got good stuff. So it's again, that's why it's going to be an exciting for me to watch, you know, these matchups as they, you know, they unfold. Um, our good pitching against their good hitting, and you know they've got pretty good pitching too. Left side, Moustakis. We watched a little bit of the game last night. It's a really good club. They, you know, the term I would use for that, they seem relentless. You know, they never stop coming, um, which is uh, what a what a great characteristic to have for a ball club. They're competitive, you know, fiery bunch. I think kind of like our guys. Um, you know, it just seems like they kind of never go away. It seems like they always find a way to, to win. You know, they never die. And I think that that's a tremendous compliment for a team. So we're going to have our hands full for sure. As the first pitch approaches here in game one, we are ready to go. Harvey into the line. Strike one. That was the first pitch of the NLCS by Matt Harvey, and you can now buy that ball on MLB.com. But how does MLB account for all of these items? Well, they have an entire division for that. And joining me now is the licensing manager at Major League Baseball, Michael Posner. Great to see you once again. Great to be here. We met at City Field, and, and it really just started me down this path of game use memorabilia and the authentication method, and it, it really is fascinating. So I, I'm thankful that you're here to explain this whole process. So let's just begin with sure. MLB authentication. What is it? What is it that you guys do? Sure. Well, the MLB authentication program was started in 2000 one on the heels of an FBI sting operation called Operation Bullpen. That started out of the San Diego field office after Hall of Famer, the late Tony Gwynn, walked into Qualcomm Stadium's team store and noticed that they had baseballs that said they were signed by Tony Gwynn, but he noticed that they were not signed by him. And he said, this isn't my signature. What are you guys doing with these baseballs? How did you get them? After a little bit of back and forth, the FBI got involved, started the program, and after 34 prosecutions, uh, they have determined that almost 75% of all of the autograph merchandise out on the market is fake. Wait a minute. Okay, so now if, if in the, like say in the 90s, if I would have gotten something that was signed by any player, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, whatever, what is the probability that that item is actually not signed by him? Not very good, and you're talking to someone who's bought autographs himself uh. as a younger person and has a lot of doubts about those things. So we realized we needed to protect our fans, we need to protect our players, we need to protect our teams. So the authentication program was born out of that. And what we do now is everything that you see, whether it's a game used item or an autographed item, is directly witnessed by an authenticator that is a third party and not a member of Major League Baseball's staff or, or anyone else. And we've noticed that it's not always the most historic of items. Uh, I noticed on your website, Justin Turner, he had a hit. In the NLDS, you guys put that up on, on Major League Baseball, uh, on MLB.com. So how do you determine who has a right to that item? The player, the team, Hall of Fame? Well, from an authentication standpoint, we're about recording history. Okay. So our authenticators are at every game. All 2,430 games in the Major League schedule have at least one authenticator present. We have at least three authenticators at every postseason game. So we're short of not missing anything that happens on the field. So they're there watching the game, and when a ball comes off the field, they will know who the pitcher was, who the hitter was, what inning it happened, and what happened with that baseball. They then turn that 
over to the club and then the clubs decide where to go from there. A lot of them have their own uh, little halls of fame. Some of them have stores and some stuff goes back to the player. And the authentication process includes really these these hologram stickers are, think, are the main thing, right? Yes, the hologram is the most important part of, of what we do. It is tamper proof and each one is sequentially numbered. What it does is it gets rid of the certificates of authenticity, which as we go back to the Tony Gwynn story, that was all the provenance that anyone ever gave for an item. So if I'm forging a signature of someone, I can certainly forge that certificate of authenticity. So we have a sequentially numbered hologram. A person can go to MLB.com slash authentication and they can look up that item. And that has a little pop-up screen that tells you what this item is. And in this case with the baseball, it's a Steven Matt strikeout from game four of the division series. Do players request authentication on things? Are the teams asking for stuff? Absolutely. Do you pick them out yourselves? Absolutely. No, it, it is something that everyone that is involved in the game uh, is aware of and that there are th and they know that there are authenticators at every game so when Derek Jeter played his last game at Fenway Park we had an authenticator in the visiting clubhouse sitting by his locker and when Derek came off he handed him his batting gloves his cleats his jersey his cap the bat he used everything and that's all been recorded and you know for a lot of people that's a very historical event and it was one of the greatest Yankees of all time so to be able to say this is the item gives everyone the assurance that that everything's above board and that 20 years from now or 50 years from now even an auction house can't have what they say is Derek Jeter's bat from his last game without that hologram that someone could easily verify. Well, as a baseball fan, you understand it's really about the story, isn't it? It's that at this game where Matt Harvey was on the mound, that's when I asked such and such out to our first date. We ended up getting married five years later or what have you. There's always a story behind each one of these items, and that's what brings it to life. Absolutely. There's a father taking his son or daughter to their first game, and now they have an ability to memorialize that with something that was in the field of play. And I wish I had that when I was younger, but back you know, in the early 80s when I was going to uh, Mets games at Shea, it didn't didn't exist but you know for my nephew when he went to his oh. first game I made sure that oh. he had a ball from the game this isn't something that we can make I can't I, you know we can make t-shirts everyone's got the Mets championship t-shirt around town but these items are so unique that's what draws people to it it's it's a one of one you said one of the biggest problems is chain of custody. You want to make sure that you see this item in someone's hands at all time. Okay, so let's say I'm a fan and I catch Daniel Murphy's sixth home run in the NLCS or seventh one in the World Series, seventh straight game with the home run in the World Series. What is the best way to make sure that we stay inside Major League Baseball's authentication rules? Well, part of what makes this program work is that we can actually we do have to say no and we have limitations of what we can do because we want to make sure that when people get these items they have absolute confidence in the process that's taken place so once a baseball leaves the field goes into the stands and goes into an area where there are people who have access to it uh, other than team officials we cannot authenticate it at that point. So that's it. So that guy is that's not going to get that authenticated. We can't authenticate. Now, it, it's not a matter of us saying we don't believe the person. But again, it's I want to make sure that everyone involved in the process, whether they're buying something, with, whether it's going to a Hall of Fame, that they have 100% confidence in the fact that this is Matt Harvey's jersey from game one of the NLCS. And this is Jake DeGrom's jersey from uh, game five of the NLDS and game three of the NLCS. If we start bending the rules, you know, we, we'd like to make everyone happy, but we, we can't because if we start going down that path, then who's going to believe that these are actually the jerseys? There are cases, let's say David Wright's 500th home run game. We have a process of marking the baseballs. There'll be a mark that the umpires can see on it, so they sequence the balls into play. Prior in the right to order. it being pitched. Correct. And then there's another marking that we put on it that no one can see. It requires a special machinery to see it. So if that ball gets hit into the stands, we know which ball we're looking for. We can then verify the mark and then we can authenticate it. Licensing manager with the MLB, Michael Posner. You guys are going to be busy. You and your team are going to be very busy for this World Series. Thanks so much for coming in and shedding some light. For My us. pleasure. All right, we're going to give you an update on how Rutgers is doing against the number one college football team in America. And early in the hockey season, a pair of rivals doing battle in the city of brotherly love. We'll see if the blue shirts can come out with two points.
Welcome back. Well, it doesn't matter that it is early in the NHL season. Anytime the Rangers and Flyers hit the ice, it is going to be a fast, hard hitting, attacking game. It is Broadway versus Broad Street, a rivalry game down in Philly. And as expected, Henrik Lundqvist is making plays to start the season. His goals against average is two through the first seven games. So far, he's got 43 saves against the Flyers. Mad advantage for New York in the second. Derek Broussard scores by way of deflection in front of the net. The equalizer ties it at two, and it's still tied at two in overtime. Devils in Buffalo tonight looking for their fourth straight win. Jersey boys are seventh in the NHL in power plays. It's not supposed to include shorthanded goals, but Adam Henrique scoring his sixth of the season. That ties him for most in the league. Devils hang on to beat the Sabres four to three. Islanders trying to pick up a win in St. Louis for the first time in 10 years. Both squads come in among the best in the league as far as shots per game. Here's Kyle Oposo with New York for New York with three minutes left in the opening period. And right now, the Islanders leading the Blues 2-0 in the second intermission. Ohio State, they are the defending national champions. Number one in the nation. They have a proud history of running through the Big Ten like a road grader. But, you know, they've looked shaky enough to make us wonder if they could be upset. It's happened almost nearly a couple of times this year. Rutgers had their crack at them tonight, but right now Ohio State is dominating. It is 21-0 at the half. And you probably couldn't tell by their record, but Army is playing a lot better than their 2-6 and six record suggests. Six of their games have been decided by seven points or less. They were matching blows with Rice, but the Cadets left enough time on the clock for Rice to orchestrate the game-winning touchdown with 24 seconds left. Army loses another close game, 38-31. I want to thank you for watching tonight, and a special thanks to our guest, Michael Posner. For producers, Mike Jimenez and Philippe Nascimento, I'm Steve Overmeyer. Take care.